Hello dear friends. Today we will get acquainted with the memoirs of a Dutch volunteer who served in the 5th Armored Division of the SS Viking. According to the most modest data, about 40,000 Dutch volunteers served in the elite troops of Germany. On June 21, 1940, the foundation of the SS Viking Division was created in Holland, the Westland Regiment. The 5th Division also included volunteers from the Nordland and Germany regiments. The division fought in the USSR on the Southern Front as part of Army Group South. Let's start from the beginning. When I was still quite a boy, we often went to visit very good friends of my parents who lived in the east of Holland near the German border. In 1936, we went to Germany by car, because my parents and their friends knew a restaurant where we could taste a wonderful trout dish. It was a sunny summer day, and when we entered a small German town, some kind of festival was taking place in it. Swastika flags were flying, posters, garlands and flowers were hanging everywhere, and the town looked amazing. I saw groups of guys from the Hitler Youth marching and singing, and they seemed so happy that I began to think about how wonderful it all was, until my father told his friend, look at these kids. It's terrible, they will grow up, and nothing good will come out of them. I just couldn't figure it out. My family has always been anti-Nazi, but not anti-German. When my father uttered these words about the young German guys who marched and sang in such a happy mood, leading me to delight, I had pro-Nazi feelings. These feelings were strengthened because I often disagreed with my father, which led me to the Waffen SS. I became a black sheep in the family, but my mother, brother and sisters continued to write letters to me. Training we liked most of our commanders the squad leader, the platoon commander, the company commander we not only liked them, we respected them. If we were wet, cold and exhausted, then we knew that the same would happen to our commanders. I remember only one non-commissioned officer who was disliked it was a corporal who mistreated the Flemings. One Christmas evening, when he was drunk to the point of unconsciousness, we wrapped him in a blanket, dragged him down the stairs feet first, threw him into one of the washing troughs and turned on the cold water. They hit him on the first day, but his colleagues did not react to this in any way. After that, he behaved much more decently. The training was mainly focused on disciplinary issues. We were hammered into the head that the commander's orders should be obeyed. If your commander was, for example, just Oberschutz, who was only one step above you, it didn't matter at all he was already your commander. Nevertheless, we were never ordered to do anything that made no sense, such as jumping out of a window without first checking its height above the ground, and so on. However, we could have been ordered to lie down in a ditch filled with water or in blackberry bushes, or plop down in the melted wet snow. Sometimes it turned into a contest between the will of one person and the will of everyone else. This did not mean that they wanted to break our spirit, not at all, it just meant that the order given to us had to be carried out. Once we were on exercises in the middle of a field that was flooded during a flood, then froze, and then partially thawed that is, the ideal option for finding shelter. At first, everyone tried not to get wet, keeping the body on the weight on the toes and palms, but as the strength dried up, we moved to the elbows and knees. In the end, we realized how useless it is to disobey orders, and began to flop on the ground with our whole body. We even started messing around, trying to throw ourselves on the ground closer to our non-commissioned officer and knock him down. In the end, we succeeded, and the rest of the non-commissioned officers who managed to stay dry laughed heartily at him. Cleaning and cleaning was a cult. If you were told that your room, rifle or uniform should be clean, it was understood quite literally. Cleaning usually took place on Saturday mornings. It started with the fact that all the guys, crawling on all fours, scraped the stone floors of long corridors and stairs. After this was done, and meeting the requirements of the commanders could mean two or three repetitions of cleaning, we started cleaning our rooms. 
We moved beds and cupboards, scrubbing floors and wiping dust from all slats and shelves. The windows were scrubbed with wet newspapers. All this was followed by an inspection, and how we would spend our weekend depended on its results. They inspected not only the rooms, but also each soldier, his cot, bed, and the contents of the locker. The only thing that was not checked was a soldier's satchel, in which we kept personal belongings, writing paper, photographs, letters from home, and so on. Soon I came to the conclusion that it is better to have only two, two toothbrushes, two combs, two razors, two handkerchiefs, two pairs of socks. One day, during an inspection, a match was found behind the leg of the cabinet. They didn't tell us anything, but that night around eleven o'clock in the evening, when we were all asleep, we were ordered to line up with a full spread and take out one blanket. When we lined up, four guys were ordered to take a blanket by the corners, put a match in the center. Then we marched for about an hour, after which we had to dig a hole measuring one meter by one meter, and one meter deep to bury a match in it. The next morning, everything went as it had before, as if nothing had happened. In the training part at Bad Tolts, we took an introductory course and received the title of Standard Tenebra Junker. Here, a heated argument broke out between one of the instructors and our Danish comrade. The dispute revolved around a violent alliance between European countries and Germany. This dispute turned into something more substantial than just a disagreement between two people, we all entered into a debate. It became clear that many Teutonic volunteers have a negative attitude to the occupation of their countries by Germany. Feelings flared up, and gesticulation was required. That very evening, almost all foreign cadets sewed emblems in the form of their national flags to the left sleeve. Usually only some of the cadets wore such emblems. The next day, there was no reaction from the instructors or officers. No one complained, no one asked anything, but a few days later the officer who took part in the dispute was transferred to a frontline unit. As for the indoctrination, of course, I remember it well. We were ordered to work through certain parts of Hitler's book Main Kampf and prepare to answer questions for the next lesson. We didn't like it at all. I had to spend a lot of my free time on something that we didn't have much interest in. The language barrier was also a considerable problem. For most of us, it would be very difficult to explain what we have read in this book, even in our native language. Well, we didn't even know many ordinary words and simple expressions in German. We understood the commands, we knew the German names of all the components of our weapons and uniforms, and in the city we had no problems when we ordered beer, some dish or talked with someone from the locals. But our dictionary did not include any political terms. In the academic part, we also studied Weltanschauung philosophy and politics. Our instructor's name was Weidemann. He also used Main Kampf, but delved into this book much deeper. Again, we didn't really like it, but thanks to this, interesting moments arose. In our room, among the eight cadets, there was a Dutchman from the city of Nijmegen named Franz Godhart. He was already a career SS sergeant and wore a gold German cross. We did not know exactly why he received this order. Every evening, when we had to do homework, he found an opportunity to get out into the city. He would appear shortly before lights out, ask what was set for tomorrow, look through his notes and go to bed. The next day he always answered all the questions confidently. Our instructor could appoint one of us to the role of an ideological enemy, for example, a communist, when he himself represented a member of the NSDAP, ready to stand up for the interests of the party and the fatherland. He usually quickly defeated us in an ideological dispute. However, he once told Gedhart that he would play the role of an English newspaper reporter in the discussion. Godhart won confidently, and Weidemann completely lost his composure and looked like a complete fool. Battles near Kursk The order to perform came on the 11th of July, 1943. We set out in the early evening, moved all night, 
slept during the day. Every day we tried to look different in order to mix the cards for those who could track our movements. Sometimes we put all our weapons on display, then we hid them. One day we wore tunics, another a tunic, the third we were in camouflage. We even changed the insignia of our division on trucks. The Russian partisans must have been at a loss to figure out which units were on the march. Finally we arrived at the place and turned around, breaking up into small groups. When you are in such a fighting order, you have no idea what is happening to the same as you on the right or on the left. Our company came across a convoy of trucks with Wehrmacht soldiers, who, apparently, the Russians knocked out of defensive positions. As we moved forward, we abandoned the use of trucks due to enemy artillery fire. We jumped to the ground and walked. The road was country, the ground was soft and sandy, which made our march, especially with a heavy machine gun on our shoulders, very tiring. I was already exhausted when our commander caught up with me and took the machine gun from me to give me some time to rest. All this time he was urging us to move as fast as possible, because there was an urgent need for us. In the end, we took the positions left by someone, and there was a respite. The positions we occupied were excellent, the trenches and dugouts were well dug and equipped. The Russians must have attacked here with large forces and quite unexpectedly, because in the dugouts we found a lot of unpacked parcels and a huge amount of all kinds of equipment and supplies. We had a good time choosing new socks, underwear, and so on. In the middle of this celebration of life, a messenger from the company headquarters appeared with the following message, Monk and his second number to arrive at headquarters immediately. I was beside myself because I had to leave all this wealth and go to the company commander. When we got to him, he ordered us to take a firing position in the trench for the defense of the headquarters. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon. At about five o'clock in the evening, a prisoner was brought in, who reported that the Russians, supported by tanks, would attack early in the morning on the 19th of July. And he told the truth. It soon became clear that this attack was quite successful, I saw Russian infantrymen moving from right to left right in front of my trench. I had an MG-34 an excellent machine gun, very reliable and highly accurate. My second number was a Romanian a farmer's son. He didn't speak German well, but his willingness to help me was above average, as was his physical strength. Where any other second number carried two boxes of cartridges, he carried four and at the same time did not lag behind. There was a shortage of brass in Germany at that time, so cartridges for rifles and machine guns were made of steel and then varnished to prevent rust. So I was there. I had an excellent machine gun, a first class second number and a lot of ammunition of poor quality. Usually we tried to control the shooting and release only short bursts. This time, however, the number of enemy soldiers moving in front of us was so significant that long bursts of fire were required. This caused the barrel to overheat, and even before I had time to change the barrel, the machine gun jammed. The lacquered cartridge got stuck in the red-hot barrel. While making efforts to debug the machine gun, I forgot about the need to hide, and at that moment it seemed to me that someone hit me on the shoulder with a hammer. I didn't feel any pain but fortunately I could still move my arm. Then I heard a noise to my right and saw my number two jump into the trench, as if about to pick up another box of ammunition. In fact, the bullet hit him in the left temple and killed him. It looked like the shot was from somewhere on the left. Looking there, I saw Russians in brown uniforms. Since my machine gun was out of order, I fired my pistol several times in that direction, and then ran away along the bottom of the trench. Soon I came across several SS soldiers, whom I identified as staff workers, cooks and quartermasters. They were not real frontline soldiers, so it was not surprising that none of them knew what to do. The commander of our company was lying on the ground. The guys said he was killed, but I decided to take a closer look at him. The bullet entered his head near his left ear. The wound looked fatal 
and I thought he was really dead, but he moved. The guys pointed to a trench and told me that they wanted to use it to get to the battalion headquarters. I picked up my commander and was about to follow them, but then he managed to tell me not to follow them, but to go forward, to where the anti-tank unit next to us was located. The guys told me that the officer was in a fever, and did not pay any attention to his words. Me and another Dutchman decided that he was telling the truth. I put his hand on my shoulders and started walking, but every time he heard a shot, he made an attempt to walk himself and stepped on my heels, and eventually we fell to the ground. My Dutch friend was wounded in the thigh and could barely move himself. The easiest thing turned out to be just to carry my commander, throwing him over his shoulder. It was not pleasant here, because my wounded shoulder started to hurt, but we continued to move. My comrade was trailing behind me, while several Russians were following him at some distance, who held him at gunpoint. They were just as scared and confused as we were, and in the end, one shot was enough to force them to hide. At some point I stopped to catch my breath. This allowed my commander to open his tablet and show me where we were going. I wanted to believe that he was right, although apart from the three of us and a handful of Russians following us, there was no one in sight at all. We ran into the end of the trench and continued our way along the top until I saw a bunch of trees where, according to the commander, our anti-tank unit was located. Immediately after that, we fell into a large funnel and took shelter in it. I told the Dutchman to help me, because I was completely exhausted. Now he was carrying the commander, and half an hour later a Volkswagen drove up to pick us up. I was taken to a dressing station, the wound was treated and told, to my relief, that the wound was shallow and there were no serious injuries. Here I met once again with my platoon leader, who told me a sad story. Almost the entire company was killed when its positions were crushed by Russian tanks early in the morning. After that, I was transported to a hospital located in Dnipropetrovsk. By the 23rd of August, 1943, I had recovered and received a vacation home. When I arrived home, I saw there a parcel with an iron cross of the second degree. The embarrassed mother gave me my award along with a cover letter from my company. Fighting on the Dnieper Line By this time, many of the guys in our unit were already outsiders, mostly Romanians. Our defensive line ran along the Dnieper. The area was open, overgrown with bushes and small woodlands with sparse groves. The Russians made several attempts to attack through this favorable, from their point of view, strip, but each time we managed to beat their attacks. They couldn't move at night without making noise, so we didn't have any special problems. On November 2, 1943, we felt that something was going to happen, because we heard Russians singing songs and generally making noise. In other words, they drank their vodka ration, which was supposed to give them courage before the attack. Of course, at 6 o'clock in the evening we received information that the attack was about to begin. At that time, I was in command of the squad and immediately sent everyone from the dugout to the trenches. Everyone left, except for one Romanian, who told me that someone had taken his helmet, and the one that remained was too small for him. He wanted to stay to guard the dugout. I told him everything I thought about it gave him my helmet and left the dugout with only a cap on my head. Then I joined my second number, who was already next to the machine gun. The attack began, more fierce than usual, but we repulsed it again. As usual, at this moment our artillery began firing, blocking the way to retreat for the Russians who were under machine gun fire. This time the shells fell very close to us. I heard explosions to our left one at a distance from us, the other in general quite close. The third hit the spot. It exploded right in front of us and smashed our machine gun. We were a moment too late to rush to the bottom of the trench. It seemed that some huge weight pushed me down. My second number started swearing, shouting that the bastards tore off his nose. But it wasn't so bad a tiny splinter pierced his nose across 
and blood gushed out of him like from a slaughtered pig. We decided to move to the dugout so that I could bandage him. To my surprise, I found that I couldn't move. I thought I just sat my legs out when I was squatting. When the next shell fell, I was thrown to the bottom of the trench so hard that I scratched my face on the ground. I shouted to my friend not to be a booby and calm down. He helped me get to the dugout, however, already on the spot, he said that he did not even touch me and, in any case, did not push me. It occurred to me that something was wrong. I couldn't feel my legs under me, so I unbuckled my belt, the lower buttons of my jacket and began to feel my back. It seems that I didn't find anything unusual. I pulled down my trousers, examined my legs, but again I found nothing. I started dressing my friend. Then we smoked a cigarette, and I felt that I was hot I was just sweating. I took off my cap, and blood poured down my face. I felt the wound on my head and realized why my legs were not working. After a while, I was dragged along the trench to a place where it was wide enough to fit a stretcher. Then I was taken to the collection point of the wounded, where I remained waiting for transport to be sent to the rear. There were enough wounded there. The Russians went on the attack again, and all the wounded who were able to carry weapons returned to the trenches. Those who remained had to take care of themselves. We were given hand grenades, machine guns and wished good luck. We understood everything. It would have taken a lot of people to take us to the rear, but there was nowhere to take them. The Russians opened fire on us we started shooting back. They threw grenades at us we threw grenades at them too. Fortunately, the Wehrmacht units, supported by light tanks, went on the attack. We did not lose a single wounded man, although some, including me, received new wounds, thank God, quite light. After that, I was dragged to some kind of dugout occupied by Wehrmacht soldiers. It was a deep bunker with a well-protected entrance and a very thick ceiling. There were tables and light chairs inside. The radio was playing, and everything looked almost like a propaganda picture. During our counterattack, several prisoners were captured. They were used, as usual, for carrying ammunition and for transporting the wounded. To get to the dressing station, we had to cross a fairly flat open field. The enemy was shelling this space, and after each break, the captured Russians threw the stretcher on which I was lying and looked for shelter. The guy who was on the side of the head showed great care and lowered the stretcher carefully. By this time I had a terrible headache, and the fact that the stretcher was thrown to the ground did not improve my condition. I told the guy who was on the leg side that if he throws me again, I'll shoot him. I warned him a couple of times. After each warning, he became more cautious, but soon abandoned the stretcher again. In the end, I pulled out my gun and fired over his head. After that, everything went like clockwork. Camaraderie I arrived in the town of Elwangen from the Krakow Hospital on the 4th of June, 1944. I think that the time I spent in this city was the best during the entire period of my service in the Waffen-SS thanks to the unit I got into. I ended up in the 3rd Company of the 5th Reserve Training Battalion. All the other officers were afraid of our company commander. If something happened between him and another officer, he waited until Saturday. On Saturday evenings we went to the cinema. After the movie, he waited until the company, whose commander had annoyed him in some way, left the cinema hall. We waited for a while and then followed them. Marching, all the companies were singing something. At the moment when we started to overtake the company in front of us, marching faster than the guys from this company, and singing another song louder than them, our competitors lost their stride and started singing at random. This meant that their commander would get for such flaws. In most cases, such actions were taken if there were any friction between the company commanders or soldiers of different companies. There was also a positive side to this. After such an incident, another company began to treat training with more enthusiasm, they marched and sang better, 
but none of the companies could beat the one in which I served. This is a unique feeling to march in formation all as one, to participate in drill on the parade ground, when all movements are carried out so synchronously that each of them is accompanied by one clear click. Relations with the civilian population In general, when people talk about the SS, they mean concentration camps, the brutal murder of prisoners of war and civilians. We all know about police officers who treated people extremely badly. We know about those who killed and tortured, we know about armies that committed war crimes, but all this does not mean that everyone who wore a military uniform was a beast. The terrible thing is that when it comes to the SS, everyone is considered scoundrels both Algamina SS and Waffen SS. The Waffen SS troops consisted of volunteers. These were soldiers with a minimum level of political preferences, whereas the SS Algamina was full of members of the Nazi party, not soldiers. Most of those who talk about SS actually mean Algamina. We who fought in the Waffen SS were just soldiers, maybe a little higher level than the average Wehrmacht soldier, but this was probably due to the fact that we were all volunteers. For example, in the village of Apolonovka, north of Dnipropetrovsk, the local Russian population was treated by our Dutch doctor, the SS Hauptsturmfuhrer, completely free of charge. Another time we were standing near the village of Lozova, and there was a rumor that we would be transferred to France or Italy. After some time, we received an order to make wooden sleds to provide ourselves with vehicles. We had planned everything in advance. Our department needed to make four large sleds. We knew that the grandfather, who lived in one of the local farms, was going to build a house for his daughter, and, having only an axe, managed to carve an excellent rectangular beam from a fallen trunk. We haggled with him and bought this bar for two army blankets, twenty rubles, cigarettes, and several sewing needles and flints. We had a saw, and in the blink of an eye we put together four sleds, and sold the rest of the timber to other departments. However, the next day, a Romanian who spoke a little Russian and was used by our company as an interpreter, laughing at us, said that a grandmother who lived with her grandfather came to talk with the company commander. According to him, she complained that her grandfather worked hard for several weeks to carve out a bar, and now some soldiers from our company took it away. If our Untersturmfer belonged to the type of SS officers they are usually portrayed as, he would just shoot the grandmother. Instead, we were ordered to report to the commander and explain our behavior. We didn't say a word about the blankets, as it was army property, but confessed everything else. The commander decided that we could keep the sledge, since the timber had already been sawn anyway, but ordered the old men to give forty more cigarettes and ten rubles. So much for the inhumane treatment of the locals by the Waffen SS soldiers. We often traded with local products in exchange for their eggs, fried potatoes and pickles. At this level, communication with locals was allowed, but any sexual contact with Russian women was strictly prohibited. It was not difficult to follow this order, since I did not meet any attractive women. As for the figure, we could only guess what was hidden under all these many skirts. About the Russians. From our point of view, Russian soldiers were considered a little more valuable than cattle sent for slaughter. They went into battle despite the losses. I'll give you an example. One day we were standing on the edge of the forest. Then we saw the Russians pulling something like an anti-tank gun out of the trees. It was not a large caliber gun, but it was definitely possible to shoot from it. There were about five Russians next to him we saw them deploying the gun, loading it and preparing to open fire. We opened fire and shot them down. Another group came out from behind the trees. Without haste, as if it were a Sunday walk, they approached the gun. It all happened again, we shot those two. Another calculation appeared we also shot these guys, after which they left the gun alone. It was something we couldn't understand. It seemed that these people were deliberately committing suicide. Most of all, we were afraid not of death, 
not of injury, but of captivity. The Russians could behave just like animals. Somehow we got a young Russian deserter, whom we kept in our unit, because he was intelligent, helped us and knew a lot of German words. In short, he was the extra pair of hands we needed. Sometimes at night he went to the other side of the front and returned with several compatriots whom he managed to convince to desert. One morning he didn't come back. We decided that he had simply rejoined his own. A few days later we recaptured a village from the Russians. There was a tree growing in the middle of the village, where we came across our Ivan. Someone familiar with medicine pulled out his guts all the way to the end, and wrapped them around a tree. The Attitude of Compatriots During my first vacation in Holland, arriving at the train station in my hometown of Leiden, I said goodbye to another Dutchman with whom I spent a lot of time on the train. He was on his way to Alkmaar, a town 65 kilometers north of Leiden. A few months later, I heard this story. When he arrived in Alkmaar, the first thing he did was go to the hairdresser to clean himself up before meeting his parents. When he was sitting in a barber chair, the underground discharged a Sten machine gun into his back. Well, I tried not to take risks. If I was traveling on a train or bus, I always leaned my back against a wall or a window, because otherwise my fellow travelers would burn through my uniform with their cigarettes or cut it with a razor. On that first vacation, I wanted to see the family of a Dutch guy who died at the front. Since his house was not far from Leiden, I went there by bike. It was cool, and I put on my old motorcycle jacket a great black leather jacket made to fit my size. I suppose I looked like one of those sinister-looking Gestapo men, as they are shown in films about the war. I drove a long way, and then I had to carry my bike on my shoulder over a tram bridge. I was halfway across the bridge, and then someone shot at me. I threw my bike on the ground and took out my pistol, usually when we went on vacation, we took only a bayonet with us, but after listening to various stories, I decided that it would be wise to take something more serious with me. A second shot sounded. I couldn't see who was shooting at me and from where, so it didn't make sense for me to shoot myself. Anyway, no more shots were fired. The Last Days of the War At the beginning of April, 1945, the entire Junkerschul was moved to the Todna area to take part in the formation of the Nieblungen Division. This is the 38th SS Grenadier Division. I was given command of a company of Folksturm servicemen boys and elderly people, who were mainly trained in the use of Faust patrons. But this new division never entered service. There were no weapons, and the morale of the unit was very low. Nevertheless, I still sincerely believed that Germany would win the war. Just a few days later we sent the Folksturm home, and the Nieblungen division collapsed. We are back in Bad Tolts. Here we received orders to find our divisions and return to the ranks. I served in the Viking division, which at that time was fighting heavy battles in the area of the city of Graz. Our attempt, I was with three other Dutchmen with the rank of SS Stardantenoberjunker, to get to our own was fraught with great dangers. Of course, we had passes, but traveling at that point in time was a risky activity. The air was dominated by allies who shot at everything that moved even cyclists. Our travel documents expired quickly, and detachments of SS maniacs not from the Waffen SS, but from Algamina rushed through the streets, hanging and shooting those who were considered deserters. I myself have seen Waffen SS soldiers hanged from trees and lampposts. However, luck was with us, and on the 4th of April we came across an SS Standardenführer who found a use for us. This officer had forms of orders signed by Himmler personally. They gave him the opportunity to do whatever he wanted. Over the next two weeks, we confiscated all possible equipment from those military units that came across our way, and stored it on farms for later use in guerrilla warfare by werewolf detachments. This relatively safe period ended on April 29th. The Standardenführer moved us to the town of Lanzhut, where we met with the Gauleiter, the local Nazi leader. I was given a group of boys from the labor corps, 
all aged from 16 to 17, who were eager to fight, so that I could teach them how to use Faust patrons. On the 1st of May, in the Egenfelden area, near Vilsbyberg, I went out with my guys to the edge of the forest. We had to hold a defensive position in this place. Soon we saw a dozen American tanks approaching us in a single column along a narrow road. I managed to knock out the lead car, but since I understood that our situation was hopeless, I sent all the guys to look for the way home. They wept because of the collapse of their hopes, they never managed to smell gunpowder. Attitude to the leaders. All I can say about the political leaders is that we believed everything Hitler said, and I believed that Germany would win the war, right up to March 1945. I was finally convinced that the war was lost when we heard that Hitler was dead. As for Hitler himself, I thought he was a real man. He was only a corporal when he received the Iron Cross first class in the First World War. In those days it was a considerable achievement. When he delivered his speeches at congresses and rallies, he managed to capture the audience. He had the ability to turn us on in such a way that we believed everything he said and were burning with enthusiasm. Everyone I met respected and trusted Hitler, and I myself shared this opinion and feeling. What I can say about Himmler is that he was not a real man. He left the impression of a man who could not be trusted, and he was definitely not a bright representative of the Aryan race of masters either in appearance or in character. We thought Himmler looked too pathetic to command the Waffen SS. The final word. I am very sorry that I became part of a regime that created concentration camps and ordered massacres. But I, my comrades and those Germans with whom I talked, knew nothing about it. It sounds like a weak